to give a uh, brief introduction of Feather Engine Learning. Uh, for me, I'm a 60 year PhD student in the computer science department at UIC, and I also collaborate with a startup called FeatherMount on some uh, research about federated learning. This model and data often exceeds the capacity of a single machine so that people build a giant cluster with maybe hundreds of thousands of computing nodes on their own cluster or AWS or Google Cloud. Uh, this, is, uh, this setting is often called distributed learning. In this setting, although you have many machines, but all the machines still belong to the same organization, like OpenAI has a cluster, but every machine in the cluster belongs to OpenAI, and every node in the cluster could access every data sample in the data set, although they do some partition, but in theory they have the uh, uh, they they have the right to access the data sample. Uh, but in federated learning, something has changed. Uh, a model here could be a small model or a big model, depending on, depending on what you want to do. But the data is private. Here we have many computing nodes, but their data is private to their, to their own user. On the figure on the right, uh, right side, it's uh, which we have a quick example on federated learning systems with smartphone. <coughs> In this system, the service provider, a like federated learning provider, or some companies want to train federated learning models. They provide a server to coordinate all the clients. And the clients here, like the smartphones on the second row, are their users. Their user have the host the data sample. Uh, but due to some privacy concerns, the service provider don't have any access to their user data, and their user data on the device never leaves their local storage. It's never uploaded to cloud storage or anywhere else. And in this area, in the area of family learning, we study how to train models in a federated learning setting. And the most common models are neural network, but there are also works on um, the other type of models like decision tree. There are many two types of scenarios in federated learning. The first scenario is called cross device scenario. This is the uh, factory learning system with, uh, this is similar to the previous example we have seen, where the clients are smartphones. In this scenario, the, the number of clients can be huge. For example, in some uh, factory learning system from Google, they could have one or two billions of clients. The second type of scenario is called cross-silo federated learning, where the uh, devices or let's say clients are different institutes. And here the most common institutes are banks or hospitals, because the data in the bank and hospitals are very sensitive, and nobody wanna the data go beyond their or is uh, their, their own maybe data center. All right, before we, uh, okay, here are some uh, basics of factory learning system and uh, well, we'll see how a life cycle of a factory learning project like. Uh, the, in the first step is pretty standard, we have a problem identification. You want to identify what is the problem you want to solve, what is the network you want to use, and what is the type of data you'll get. And the second step is called client instrumentation. In this step, you, are, you are need to figure out what is your client, what type of device it has. Does it have an Android uh, phone or 
On iOS phone, you are for a different type of hardware. We need a different type of, let's say, a software development kit to launch your service on the device. And also, the client might be a, let's say, institute, hospital, and the difference in the client may also have some impact on the uh, model training process because different clients may have different capacity of holding the samples. On a smartphone, you may have maybe tens or hundreds of data samples per client, but in a hospital, you may have thousands or ten thousands of data samples. Uh, after you finish the client instrumentation, you could start with some simulation. Uh, this step is important because the, in the real world, you have a relatively limited computational resources for experiments. And when you run it, a single experiment may finish in one, one day, one week. There is a long term run time. So you want to first start experimenting your system with your local machine, where the clients are just simulated. It might be a thread or just a Python object. And uh, when you finish the simulation, you could start model training, model evaluation, and the deployment. These are the standard steps, but they will operate under a federated, federated learning setting. And in federated learning, its training process is the most different one from the existing uh, systems. In the iterative training process, uh, it's, iterative, it's iterative because for new network, we really need to train for a long time and just repeat for uh, many, many times. And in the first step, we sample some clients. Uh, we need sampling because uh, in some scenarios, like the cross device scenario, you can't, we, we can't have a server hold one billion of clients at each at uh, the same time, but in some other scenarios, like cross sales, I think it might be feasible to house tens of clients at the same time. And one, once all the clients are sampled, we broadcast the parameter. And here, let me use a All right, in the second step, we broadcast the model parameter from the server to every client so that, so that the clients have the start with the same parameter. Then, once all the clients get their parameter, they do some local computation. This step, uh, the local computation, is often called local steps or local outputs. These steps for neural networks are pretty standard. You just run the uh, gradient descent algorithm to optimize the parameter. Once the client computation is completed, they report their computation results to the server. And uh, once all the computation, once all the computation results are reported, the server will start aggregate. The most standard aggregation approach is called federated averaging, where it we simply average the computation results from every client. And it's also assigned a weight to each computational result in the average step. And the weight is often computed using the number of samples held by each client. Uh, for example, you, in total, you have 1,000 of data samples across clients, and one client has 100 data samples and the weight for that specific client is uh, 0.1. Uh, once the, uh, after the aggregation step, we update the model and start the next uh, training iteration. And the server will again broadcast the parameter to the clients, and the clients will train it and report it back. Uh, there are uh, many applications and uh, real applications in the industry at this moment. The 
uh, the uh, earliest application is the Google Gboard. Uh, Google Gboard is the keyboard application from uh, Google. The uh, oh, a key application, uh, a key uh, task in this application is a uh, next word prediction. So basically, when you are typing on uh, Gboard, Gboard will try to figure out what is the next word you want. And the model's quality can be good or bad. Uh, so the Google, uh, so the researchers at Google use user click, like uh, uh, they click it or ignore it. The click may uh, a click indicates that this is a useful prediction and is accepted by user. Uh, 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 then they store all this uh, uh, click information to their training cache and use their framework uh, on the Android phones or some other type of phones to train the model. And then the local training process will coordinate with the task database or task server. And just iteratively, the Google could deliver a better model for next word prediction. This is the first application in this area, and later many other applications came up. Uh, this is a application in the medical area. Uh, NVIDIA used their framework called Flyer to help researchers at uh, hospitals in Massachusetts, and they developed their models to, pr to produce better diagnostic for many type of uh, diseases. In the last application, the, this is a more recent one, Fedemal, a startup in federal learning and uh, decentralized machine learning, collaborate with a, another company called Theta Networks. Uh, Theta Networks is a Web3 company that provides decentralized uh, media service. Uh, for example, they have some decentralized uh, video over blockchain type of systems. And these two companies launches a decentralized ASU cluster <coughs> for generative and content recommendation. So basically, in the previous system uh, from Theta Networks, they only do, let's say, content delivery like videos. And with Theta now, uh, they are trying to add recommendation algorithms from those video contents. And this system is uh, decentralized. You can see in the figure in the middle, they have computer nodes across the continents. All right, this, um, this, uh, there are many interesting applications in this area, but many challenges still remain. Uh, there are many types of challenges, and in today's uh, talk, I'll briefly introduce the challenges in optimization, fairness, privacy, and security. In optimization, the main challenge is on the data distribution. So normally, in the previous setting, like local machine learning or distributed machine learning, all the, all the data is managed by us. And in the local setting, you have a unified local database. In a distributed learning setting, although the data are, let's say, partitioned and distributed to each computer node, the partition ensures that all the nodes Gas data samples that from the same independent and identically distributed, uh, identically uh, identical distrib distributions. <coughs> this uh, we ensure this ID condition across clients in distributed distributed learning setting because we have the control of the data partition and the data distribution process. But in federal learning. This no longer house. We don't have any constraint or any way to tell the clients how to prepare the data. They get their data, 
and the way I'm going over, and what we will do is just utilizing that data for training. The second challenge is on the fairness set. Uh, there are many types of uh, notation or concept of fairness, and in fact, the learning system, the fairness often means that whether the federal learning model, the single model, can serve different clients equally well. And uh, in some experiments, the performance gap over clients can be very large. Some clients may guess a model with uh, 90 or 80 percent accuracy, but for some other clients, the accuracy could drop to like 20 percent. And all these experiments are done. Uh, even and this gap remains even on some simple data sets like federated C button. The third challenge is um, privacy. Uh, since factory learning is a type of decentralized system where the clients don't trust each other, and for example, the server belongs to Google, and my device, my smartphone belongs to, my, uh, belong to myself, and uh, the other clients belong to others. Nobody knows each other, and nobody works on this, and um, not all the people. Uh, belongs to the same institute, and it's very hard to let's say build trust across the clients or servers. So that we want to add some mechanisms to make sure the server cannot pick clients' data, and some malicious clients cannot pick other's data as well. The last. Uh, challenge I'll introduce is um, the security. Since the system is decentralized, if I want to say corrupt a model from a certain institute, I could just connect my client to the training process and uh, upload some poisonous computational results to prevent the model from converting to a optimal point. In the next few slides, I'll briefly uh, discuss why the federated, the standard federated average algorithm is insufficient, and uh, talk about what is a better solution that can address these challenges. Uh, there will be many solutions, <laughs> not one solution solves everything. Uh, all right, uh, in the optimization. Uh, well, uh, talk about a paper called Scaffold. Uh, in this paper, the authors first shows a failure mode or a limitation of the standard federated average algorithm. Uh, basically, they found that in the federated average algorithm, uh, Oh, oh, okay, let me add some background first. In the federated average algorithm, the server uh, broadcasts the model to the clients, and the clients will do multiple steps of local computation, not just compute one batch. They'll compute many batches and potentially many epochs. And the authors found that when the client do more local steps, the aggregation results, like the circle in the middle, may deviate from the say, optimal parameter. This is because when the clients do more local steps, the non-identical, the non-ID or different data distribution across clients will deviate the optimization trajectory or local step trajectory so that the gaps between the parameter of different clients increases. Since we really don't know where the ground truth or the optimal point is, the, the potential gap between the average and the ground truth optimal point may get larger. Uh, to deal with this problem, the authors in the Scaffold paper 
developed a correction term to compensate for the deviation across clients in the local training step. Uh, intuitively, the correction term is computed based on the difference between the current client update, which is the uh, uh, segments between the bootouts, and the server aggregation result in the previous round. So basically, this correction term estimates how does my current model optimization tra trajectory deviates from the global one. And with this correction term, we could reduce the effect or deviation for, uh, when the local steps of each client increases. Uh, uh, let's go back to this figure. For example, this is the this line is the is the application result from the previous round, and uh, this is my current. And uh, this is my current uh, optimization tra trajectory. And they all give us a, and this algorithm will give us a correction term that points downward so that the parameter of the clients get closer to the uh, 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 computational result from the other clients. And the gap between <coughs> clients will shrink. Uh, okay, this is for the optimization. Uh, in the second part, I'll introduce another algorithm called Dito, which in improves the fairness of uh, in the federated learning system. Uh, in the federated, federated averaging algorithm, we know that uh, it computes an, an average uh, from the clients, but it is uh, often the case that the average is not optimal for everyone. So in the Dino paper, they developed another algorithm that maintains a model parameter uh, denoting that B for each client. Uh, for each client. Uh, so in, in this system, if there is one billion clients, there will be one billion model. But there is this uh, much uh, additional computational overhead because the one billion model on the client side never goes to the server. They all stay on the local device wider. Uh, in this algorithm, uh, it's a pretty easy one. Uh, first, we define a set of model parameter called V, and this parameter V always stay on the client. Uh, when we are doing the local computation of on the client side, we first do the standard uh, local computation in the uh, just as the standard federated average averages uh, algorithm uh, specifies. And here, after the local computation of the average algorithm, they add an additional uh, an additional step, try to optimize the mo local model parameter v for each client. And the computation step uh, is shown here. There are some uh, uh, symbols. Uh, but intuitively, they try to figure out a local model parameter that is close to the factory learning model parameter by adding this term. It's VK. This VK denotes the parameter on the kth client. And this W uh, this WT denotes the as a global learning model in the T round. And they add this term to make sure that their local model does not deviate much from the global model. And the first uh let's say uh, gradient term is just the uh, is from a standard gradient distance step. So overall in this algorithm they try to learn a local model for each client uh, under the constraint under the constraint that the local model does not deviate much from the global model. 
uh, in the second part, we have slightly more notations, uh, but I'll make it intuitive, as intuitive as possible. Uh, then the third part is about uh, privacy. There are many types of privacy in family learning, and we'll start with a very general definition called differential privacy. Uh, the, uh, in the high level, uh, a high level idea of the different privacy is that when you give two diff uh, when you give uh, different data to a algorithm, here the difference between the data can be very small. Maybe it's like a table that only differs by one entry from each other, and you give this to data to an algorithm. And under the, under the uh, definition of differential privacy, we want the algorithm outcome, uh, output from using these two different data sets to be as small as possible. And here in the, in the paper called Learn Differentially Private Recurrence Language Models, this is a paper from Google. They propose a user adjacent data sets. So basically, uh, they, uh, uh, they measure the difference uh, across the data, uh, between the data sets as different users by uh, adding or removing the examples associated with one user from the other user. And they use this way to define a uh, concept called adjacent data set. And then they want to make sure that the learning algorithm, which is denoted by the capital M here, uh, they learn uh, the result of the learning algorithm, which is the set of optimal parameters. They want to make sure that the, uh, optima the optimal parameters that are computed using the same learning algorithm over uh, two uh, adjacent data sets should be as close as possible, so that you can not, so that a server cannot infer the presence of a client by only observing the uh, uh, by only observing the, the optimization results. Uh, Google considers this problem of, uh, let's say, unidentifiable clients from the server side because they are the service provider. <laughs> there are other types of uh, issues in privacy. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to add a brief comment here. Uh, in this, uh, uh, another type of uh, privacy con uh, concerns is about a type of uh, data reconstruction attack where a malicious client may eavesdrop the computational results uh, that are sent to the server and once the malicious client intercepts the computational results they will run some algorithms from the data reconstruction attack family to uh, try to figure out the closest uh, data that are the most similar data that could lead to the uh, computational results. So basically, you send your computational results to the server, and uh, it has no data, but the malicious client may reconstruct your own data by only using the computational results. Uh, this uh, this is intuitive. This is intuitive because if the aggregate result is dominated by some result, or for example, is dominated by the result of the first client, then if we remove the first client in the federal learning system, it will incur a big impact on your let's say optimization result, so that the server can make a guess about whether the first client is connected the uh, system. The second step is uh, adding noise. 
uh, intuitively, um, uh, uh, technically, they add a zero mean Gaussian noise with some calibr with some uh, careful calibration over the virus. <coughs> uh, adding noise is uh, pretty intuitive. If we only have noise and no computational results, the server can not guess anything because the noise don't carry any information. And if we add those noise to the computational results, we try to find a, a balance uh, between the utility and the informativeness. If there is only noise, it has no utility and uh, no informative and no privacy concerns. Uh, uh, but if, if there is only computational results, we have no, we have less uh, uh, privacy, but more, com uh, but more utility. And by adding this noise to the computational result, we try to find a balance on these two ends. Uh, find the balance between these two ends. Okay, now we are uh, moving to the uh, last chapter. It's called uh, on security. Uh, different from the uh, say malicious clients in the privacy problems. In the security problems, we often assume a malicious client will try to corrupt the model training process. And here, the corruption means we don't want the model to converge or provide a high accuracy. Uh, in a fabric learning uh, setting, this is pretty straightforward. For example, here, we have some uh, computational results. And uh, here, I use one dimensional result for a quick uh, introduction. And the results uh, are from three clients, uh, from three clients that are denied and not malicious. And we have one result from a malicious client, and the malicious client can choose what is the value of their computational results as. And um, by observing the results from the denied clients, we know that the aggregation result should be zero. But they, with the presence of a malicious client, it could upload a say, carefully calibrated malicious value as to mislead the aggregate result to the arbitrary value. This is because the arithmetic averaging operator does not provide any robustness to say, any outliers. But you can always use a single outlier to mislead the average to anywhere. To deal with this issue, there are many uh, works on the, area, on the area called robust aggregation. And in the, on the right side, I'll briefly introduce a very simple and effective one called uh, trimming. Uh, yeah, data science user group, maybe you are already <laughs> very familiar with the Trimini operator. So in this operator, we first uh, sort the uh, uh, computational, result, uh, computational results uh, dimension by dimension, this is the element by element. We are not sorting the vectors, we are sorting the, let's say, dimensional wise values in the gradient vector. And then once all the dimensions of the computational result is sorted, we remove the largest, the a few largest and a few smallest values, and compute the average over the remaining values. This operator tries to prevent the malicious client from misleading the average result by uploading some really large or really small values. Uh, all right, this is for the uh, scripting part. Uh, before we go to the next slides, I want to go back to the privacy and add a quick comment to uh, 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 add a quick comment on this uh, uh, on the method. Here, uh, there are uh, in addition to the different privacy and the 
clipping and adding noise approach, there is another type of, of approach called skill aggregation. If you read papers in factory learning, you may see the uh, skill aggregation uh, very often. The skill aggregation is not about security, it's about privacy. And in this skill aggregation protocol, it uh, tries to, pre it, uh, um, uh, similar to the uh, work on different privacy, it tries to prevent the server from inspecting the uh, from inspecting anything from the client. And in the script aggregation protocol, they have a very intuitive and smart idea. They developed a cryptography per uh, uh, cryptography protocol. Uh, the methodology says it goes beyond uh, data science and machine learning, and the paper is from the security area. <laughs> Uh, they developed a cryptography protocol so that every pair of clients, uh, a pair of two clients, agree on a secret. And the secret has the same shape of, uh, uh, have, has the same shape to the computational result. So you can add the secret to the computational result. And just for a uh, for a pair of clients that agree on the same secret, the protocol lets one client add the secret to their computational result and let the other clients subtract the secret from the computational result so that none of the ground truth computational result is reviewed after the clients report their results. But since uh, in the average step, we all have one computational result that is added using, uh, that is added by the secret, and another result is that is subtracted by the same secret. And in the application step, the uh, the addition and the subtraction operator will cancel each other so that the average is not changed. But the uh, uh, but the message or computational result from the client will be protected by the secret. Uh, this is another type of approach. Uh, but uh, this is another type of approach. Uh, for the two main type of approaches, they have their own advantage and uh, problems. For the different, for the uh, common approach on different privacy. A uh, common limitation is the trade-off between the privacy and the utility. When we add more noise to get more privacy guarantees, your model, your model's accuracy will degrade a bit due to the added noise. Uh, in the secure aggregation protocol, you don't lose any accuracy because the uh, average step gives you the exact same result. But this protocol is very expensive and don't scale up uh, and don't scale up very well. You can't run it uh, across billions of devices. And the protocol itself also needs many many problems and it's not a robust to some less user dropout. <laughs> yeah, if your if a if a smartphone is this connected from the system due to, let's say, low battery, then the security protocol needs to run from scratch again. And, uh, uh, but there are many existing, um, uh, there are many, say, recent papers and active recent efforts that are trying to improve the methods uh, of, and gain more privacy. Uh, all right, uh, this is a Back, uh, overview and introduction of existing uh, works. And in the next couple of slides, I want to uh, briefly introduce my recent uh, research called Environment Aggregator. And this Environment Aggregator is deployed on the server side and will try to uh, defend against uh, a type of attack called backdoor attack. Uh, here, this is the problem uh, description. 
in this uh, paper, we consider a setting where malicious clients are construed by adversaries, and the adversaries inserts poisonous data samples to the trick set on the malicious clients. And a very common type of poisoning attacks are called backdoor attacks. And the backdoor attacks uh, embed something to a backdoor sample. Uh, the most common uh, type of backdoor attack is embed the trigger and assign a wrong label. Here the wrong label is specified by the adversary, and it can be arbitrary label. Um, in, in, in practice, this type of attack can raise a lot of concerns. For example, this type of attack can help adversaries that have some anomaly detection algorithms, and the anomaly detection algorithms are very common in, let's say, bank or some email or uh, some email providers like uh, phishing email detection. <coughs> um, the figure below are some uh, examples of the backdoor samples. In the first example, uh, it's maybe too small for uh, some of the audience uh, and I'll describe it properly. Here in this figure, the Backdoor trigger are semantic triggers, which is a blue color on a airplane. And the adversary wants the model to believe that a blue airplane is a truck. And in the second example, they add a stroke to a digit 7 and wants the model to believe that the digit 7 is some other digit, and maybe one or something. Uh, these two are visual, uh, uh, visual backdoor samples. They are also text backdoor samples. Uh, they, the adversary could control some uh, uh, segments of some words, for example, if the text has a character Y all is actually uh, a abbreviation of a director or goes la famous and they want a, 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 a some language model to produce or classify a negative sentiment of this uh, uh, director or of this uh, particular name. <coughs> and in this work our objective is avoiding entangling the backdoor trigger or use the backdoor trigger in prediction. Uh, this is what, how we do that. Uh, I don't have, uh, we don't have enough time to explain why we need this and uh, how the theory works. Uh, but I'll explain the main idea. Uh, in this work, we believe that we hypothesize that a machine model will learn to predict using the trigger because its underlying training algorithm like standard, uh, like the stochastic random descent or federated average, this is stochastic random descent, greatly maximize the predictive accuracy. And since the backdoor trigger, if could help the model make a so uh, make a correct prediction or a prediction uh, specified by the adversary, then the model will pick it because it provides more accuracy. Uh, in contrast, to solve this problem, we enforce the learning models to be generally useful for every client or the majority of the clients and don't learn something that is only useful for a few clients and possibly malicious clients. In the method, we first measure the environments. Uh, the environments is a, a conceptual measure of the usefulness across clients. So this way we want to measure whether this computational result or this aggregated computational result can benefit many clients. And technically, we use the consistency of the sign of the 
gradients or computational results. Here we use the sign because the sign, a, the sign is a binary, and the binary value allows the clients to vote. So then we could figure out whether there are whether there are many clients that go, wanna go to the same direction, and whether for some other direction the many clients don't have a very consensus opinion on it. And then we use the previous measure through the algorithm to make sure that the aggregation result follows the follows the variant direction and is not misled to arbitrary directions by the adversary. Uh, all right, this is the recent work, and uh, I'll also briefly introduce some uh, some of the platform developed by Fedemal. I've been using these platforms for like three or four years, and I'm um, in general happy with the uh, um, with its functionalities. Uh, uh, in the open source library, they have uh, uh, they have. Uh, implementations for both uh, research and uh, development. Uh, for research, for my own research, I often use the custom customizable simulations to for my own code. And I'll briefly show how simple it is. Yeah, this is a uh, this is an implementation of a <coughs> uh, MDC example. Uh, in this implementation, you will only need to implement a server file and a client file. And in the client file, you uh, will only need uh, a few lines of code to prepare the data and model. And once it's all prepared, you uh, use a script to run the server and you run the client, and it's pretty easy. Uh, all right, for the uh, department side, well, they, they also have a open box solution uh, that helps you pack your research code and develop, uh, deploy it on the server and uh, run your own training algorithms and uh, inference algorithms. It's pretty straightforward and everything uh, can be done by as a dragon of the boxes. Uh, all right, this is the uh, end of this presentation and the questions are welcome. Let's give Shane.